Today does mark a grim milestone for Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. Two years ago, they were detained in China. Two years ago today, in what is widely seen as retaliation for Canada's arrest of the Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. Michael Kovrig's resiliency has got him this far, with friends and loved ones describing his strength as inspiring. And his wife, Vina Najibula, sends letters, but she says those have become sporadic thanks to the pandemic. Earlier today, though, something horrible happened. A mistranslation suggested that both Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor had been indicted and tried. It was terrifying. Then Canadian officials were cl to clear up. It was all a mistake. So their situation remains the same. But what is next for them? Joining us now is Vina Najibula to talk about her husband, Michael Kovrig, and the situation. Vina, always good to have you back on the program. It is, as we said, a grim milestone, two years it's almost unbelievable that you and I have been talking and you've been waiting for two years. What is a day like this for you, two years of detention for your husband? Hi, Evan. Thank you so much for having me on the show again. Um, you're absolutely right. This is a challenging day. It has been a grueling two years for us, for, for Michael, uh, for everyone who is working to secure his freedom. Um, it is unbelievable, like you say, that here we are two years later, still speaking about him being in detention. None of us would have imagined this was going to be the case. I, when we last spoke in June, I hoped sincerely that Michael will be home with us by now. And instead, he's facing a prospect of his third Christmas uh, alone in isolation in detention. And, and today was even more difficult because there was a mistranslation that said that both your husband, Michael uh, Kovrig and Michael Spavor had been both tried and indicted. That proved to be false. I can't imagine uh, what that did to you when you heard that. Yes, well, it's, it's part of the daily uncertainty that we have been living with. Um, any time, any moment, something like this can happen. And... That is mentally exhausting. I mean, first of all, it's mentally exhausting for Michael, who is experiencing all of this in complete isolation. At least out here, we have the support of each other, our family, friends, and are able to cope with news like that. But um, this morning's news, as you said, uh, proved to be not true, uh, not accurate. Uh, it was a translation error. So from everything that we understand so far from our embassy in Beijing and from uh, the government in Ottawa is that uh, there has been no change to the legal status of our Michael and Michael's power. Can, can you, a, a lot of folks are wondering how they, how they're living. Like what is their living conditions? You say in isolation. Can can you describe what they're living? Like what they what are their conditions that they've been living in for two years? I mean, it's hard to provide a lot of detail, Evan, in part because especially this year, uh, because of the pandemic, our contact has been very limited. Uh, right. Between January and October, there were no consular visits. There were very few letters uh, from Michael. Um, finally, in October, we were able to get a consular visit and at least a confirmation and a reassurance that he is still healthy and is doing well. In terms of his day-to-day, -day, what we can um, rely on are some of the earlier letters and some of the things that he had shared, which is that it's, uh, it's the environment is extremely barren, uh, concrete, uh, that there's not very much external uh, stimulation or, um, and that it's extremely regimented. Um, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's a detention facility, so mm -hmm. uh, absolute lack of freedom. And that Michael is doing everything he possibly can to uh, keep his mind uh, occupied with positive thoughts, with virtuous thoughts, with prayers of gratitude, with um, philo philosophical passages. Um, reading really is kind of the, um, provides him uh, most solace day to day. Like he essentially says that that is um, right. what gets him through moment to moment is being able to read and have access to books, um, which we've been advocating for quite a bit as well. And, and he had finally, first of all, I just want to reiterate, 10 months without a consular visit, 10 yes. months. Um, uh, that, are you able to contact him frequently? How often can you guys write letters? So, um, since the beginning of, of the detention back in December of 2018, we were on this uh, monthly um, schedule, so monthly consular visits and monthly exchange 
of letters, uh, but all of that changed uh, because of the pandemic in January. So um, now the consular visits have resumed. There was one in October, one in November, and we were really relieved. I mean, it was extremely frustrating not to have them for those 10 months, but a great relief when right. we finally got them. On the letters, they're still uh, sporadic. So we are writing to him and every month as before, and we hope that he's getting those right. letters. But, and then he did have that visit from Ambassador Barton, the Canadian ambassador in China, um, who said, by the way, both Michaels were coping well. What do you make of that? What does that kind of report mean to you? I mean, it was really, um, it was a huge relief to hear that he's healthy. And what I take from that is that um, both our Michael and Michael Spavor are drawing on everything that they've got, that this has been a daily struggle to stay healthy, to uh, stay mentally focused on um, the day that they will be free. Certainly our Michael speaks of that, of uh, how much he misses being uh, with us, with family, with, with people, human contact, and how much he misses um, nature. Uh, like many Canadians, Michael loves the outdoors. Uh, he specifically mentioned in one of his letters how much he yearns to be back in the Laurentians and the woods and the mountains uh, of Quebec are calling him. And so I know that uh, one way to stay uh, mentally focused uh, for him has been focusing on what he can do when he finally will be free and reunited with all of us. The incoming and impending Biden administration, um, does that offer any hope? I mean, there's lots of talk that obviously the, the case of the two Michaels is connected to the Meng Wanzhou and I appreciate you don't have a lot on that side of the equation, but they're certainly politically, as you know, they've been deeply and profoundly linked. Does the Biden administration offer any hope to pressure China to release the two Michaels? Well, since day one, uh, our government has been saying that they've been working very closely with the U.S. precisely because of that link that you mentioned, Evan, that this whole situation exists in a bigger geopolitical context of U.S.-China competition and the extradition request of Meng Wanzhou. So uh, I have understood that since day one, this has been an issue in not only our relationship with China, but also with the United States, obviously, and that there have been uh, conversations. And I was heartened to see that uh, when the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, made a phone call to uh, President-elect Biden to congratulate him on his election, that this was one of the issues that they discussed, that it was made clear that for Canadians, securing the release of uh, our Michaels is a key priority. And I certainly am hopeful. Um, I, I pray that we uh, will be seeing light at the end of the tunnel. It has been two years, lots of ups and downs, um, a lot of commitment and um, words of reassurance and here we are, two years down the road, um, and Michael still remains um, behind bars. And we are reassured that they are healthy. We're reassured right. that Michael is uh, staying resilient, but it is taking a toll. And this detention is arbitrary, it's unjust, and we must do, and Canadian government must do everything uh, they can to, to end it. Just before I let you go, uh, I mean, we know the situation with China is very tense, and, and, and you you got to tread incredibly carefully because your husband is in detention there. Um, you probably have a lot of worries. I understand the hope. The hope is that they get released. Um, what's your biggest concern right now? Well, every day I worry for my, Michael's health, particularly mental health. Um, it is remarkable that after two years, he continues to be strong. But um, this is such an unpredictable situation, and he's in such a difficult predicament that our biggest worry is his well-being. And that's why with every passing day, uh, those risks uh, to his health and well-being go up. And my, my hope and my prayers for his release uh, grow stronger. Nina, uh, I... I enjoy our conversations because I, they're so passionate and powerful uh, in terms of your advocacy for your husband. I wish we didn't have to have them because I wish he gets released like all Canadians and, and you can stop this job that you never wanted to advocate for his freedom. Um, we hope he's safe and healthy and I really appreciate your courageous advocacy on his behalf and on uh, Michael Spavor's behalf. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Evan, and thank you so much for the support of all Canadians as well. I would be remiss not to mention how 
gratifying that is to feel the solidarity of all Canadians across the country. Thank you.